please remember the views and opinions expressed by this show or any other show on DV Radio and its guests are strictly those of said individuals and do not reflect those of the DV Radio staff nor the staff of dysfunctional veterans. Welcome to the Service Dog Show. I'm your host, Joaquin Watai, also known as PTS Dog. And I'm your host, Scav. I want to let the audience know, you know, Scav and I, we work together. We share information back and forth. I run Scout as my service dog. He's a hearing dog, PTSD dog. We're here to bring you news, interviews, and information about service dogs and about matters that are of interest to the service dog community. Thank you for joining us on the Service Dog Show on DV Radio, WDVR. And welcome to the Service Dog Show. I'm your host, Joaquin Watai, also known as PTS Dog. And I'm your host, Kev. With us, uh, we have a special guest, um, a return guest, uh, back when it was the Service Dog Show with PTS Dog. I can't remember, one of the earliest episodes, about two years ago, uh, was my friend Bart Sherwood, who is the founder and uh, director of Train a Dog, Save a Warrior. Bart, thank you very yes, much sir. for joining us. Well, thank you, Joaquin, for having us back, and Scav. And and one of the fun things is Scout Scav Service Dog is a Tadsaw dog. So oh, we, we have. I know, I know him by another name. I don't know him by. by <laughs> <laughs> right. I, you know, whenever we talk about him, I have to remind you. Of his name. Yeah, you know. It's, <laughs> you know, you know, you guys have more BS in your system than I have in mine. You know, I'm the only BS that's allowed. Bart Sherwood, otherwise. There is no other BS allowed. That's right. That's right. Well, Bert, um, you know, I don't know if the audience knows. I mean, anybody who follows PTS Dog or has for, <clears throat> for a period of time knows that, uh, and, and same with Scav on his page, that, you know, our number one go-to when someone's saying, well, how do I find a service dog? Uh, you know, whenever a veteran is asking, we always tell them, check Tad's out, contact Bart. Um, Probably what three, four times a week. I tell you, I sent a veteran. Yeah, at least that. At least that. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, Call Bart is 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 kind of our go-to. Um, tell the audience why, when people come to us and ask about where to get a service dog, why do we tell them call Tadsaw? Well, I think the reason you do is because of the philosophy we have is which in which we train the the veteran to train the dog. You know, we had all. The military took all these young men and women out of high school that had no 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 earthly idea what they were going to do when once they got in the military, and they were went through basic training to learn how to you know take apart a weapon that they were given and uh, to learn how to shoot it. And you know with that basic type ideal, when the when you go into the military, they give you a weapon, they give you a uniform, and they give you a battle buddy. You know, and you go through training with those three things through your entire military career. And, and once you start training in the military, you never finish training. You're always training no matter what. And because of that, if you really look at service dogs, service dogs is an extension of the mission that everybody joined in for when they joined the military. Mm -hmm. uh, they joined in, you know, you never stop training. Your service dog never stops training. Every time you walk out the house, there's a new encounter. You have to be able to handle it. Uh, but once you leave the military and they take the weapon away and they take the uniform away and they take your, your battle buddy away, you realize that for the first time in all those years, whether it was three years, five years, or 30 years, that you don't have a battle buddy that had your six. And you go through all this treatment and everything else trying to get back to the way you were, and the one thing you're missing is a battle buddy. Mm -hmm. And by using the dog as your new battle buddy, you're able to start handling everything better because and all over because of the fact you have that one individual that has your six, that has your back at all times. It's unconditional and non-judgmental. So by using the same philosophy that makes the military so successful, you can do it with service dogs and a program. You just have to realize that some veterans move quicker through a program and some move a little bit slower for whatever reason but you want them to all get through the game, through the training. Right. And, and I think that's why Tatsaw has been successful is because there is no rush to get through the training. It, it is as long as it takes you. We're not going to go ahead and, you know, put out a, a, a team before it's time because if they can't take care of 
the pressure that's going to come with having a service dog, then you're setting them up to fail. And if you set somebody up to fail, that's what they're going to do. They're going to fail over and over again. And so you try to set everybody up to be successful. And that's one of the thing that a dog trainer always tell you. If you set a dog up to fail during training, he will fail. And you can do that with a veteran or a team or whatever, and they will fail. But that's not what the it's about in getting a service dog. It's about being successful to be able to get back to doing things that you used to do. Right. And the dog yeah. is a great medium for it. And the, and the veteran is a great medium to handle the dog that needs a job. Yeah. So yeah. Win -win situation for everybody. Yeah. And it's definitely, I mean, as Scav can attest, um, when he came to the, to the Tatsaw trainer in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, uh, or Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, excuse me. There's a big, there's a big rivalry between those two areas. If I'm oh, you got that right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, Scav will say, you know, when he went to the trainer, he said, you know, I need, I need help with PTSD, but I also need some help with hearing. And the trainer said, I don't know how to help you train the dog for hearing alert. But Scav, and you've told me this story, she taught you how to train Scout, and you were able to work out the hearing alert yourself. Right. And she even did some of the research for me because, you know, she's a professional dog trainer. That's, you know, that's what she does. And uh, she, she researched it and gave me some ideas and, and told me, you know, certain places to go and contact. So from there, I was able to pick up and go and, and, and get the training I needed and the ideas that I needed for him. And that's, and, and the reason I wanted to bring that up is because the, the, one of the things that I like the most about the Tadsaw program is what you do is you give the veteran the tools they need to empower them to continue on their own. Right. But at she the same time, they have the continuing, if they need support, if they need to come back, if they're having trouble with a tune-up or with a the behavior, they're always welcome to come back to the oh. train. Yeah, we're not going to, I mean, just because you graduate doesn't mean that we're going to kick you out and you're on your own. I mean, you know, we would hope that if you don't need to come back, you just contact us uh, when you may need to get another dog evaluated or, or through a public access temperament test just to say you did a great job. And mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, I, I think I shared it with you about one of our teams back east. Uh, he joined our program. We got him a trainer. Uh, he had a dog. Uh, they went ahead, the, the trainer that I hired to take care of him hijacked him for her group that she had no idea how to train service dogs. And she and her friend, they started training service dogs. And so uh, they graduated him through a public access test, you know, after he'd been through training. And uh, he wondered why I never sent anything to him. And I told him, I said, well, because I never knew you graduated. I mm -hmm. figured you dropped out just like everybody else does somewhere along the line. And trainers get disgusted and they don't, they don't keep me up to date. And, uh, you know, and he said, no, he says, I, 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 he apologized for thinking that he let me down. It's like, no, I, I let you down. Cause I never did try, you know, try to follow up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he told me that he lost his first dog. You know, she, she had gotten sick, uh, mm -hmm. cancer and she, they had to put her down, mm -hmm. but he got another dog that because of the tats all training that he went through to learn how to train his own dog, he was able to train his second dog. Right. Right. And it was doing everything he needed. Mm -hmm. And, but then, you know, so the, the second dog died and that's when he called me. I want to know if I was, how everything was going. I told him, I said, you know, that everything's fine. How are you doing? He says, well, I've had two service dogs. I said, great. <laughs> Nobody told me. I yeah. said, but, but you are the epitome of what this program is about. It's not about Tadsaw. It's mm -hmm. not about an organization. It's about the veteran who goes through the program to be able to take care of himself. Right. right. And that's, what it's about. It's not about me. It's not about the organization. We are just part of the, the journey that you're going to make. We're mm -hmm. part of your going through your mission to get to the end. So, I, think, I think it's important that people understand. Now, the Tatsaw program definitely is not a match for everybody. And, and from, from discussions I've had with you, um, I think that the, the reason, the primary reason for that is because in order to successfully graduate Tadsaw training, you've got to put in the work. It's all about sweat equity. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, that, you know, Tadsaw, the trainer teaches you to train your dog. But when you walk out of class, where there, how often are, are, is the typical training classes? 
Is it once a week, twice a week? Typically, it just it depends. Once they go through, I I like I prefer to have once you start training for the basic obedience mm -hmm. to meet twice a week. One because that way you can do a couple uh, obedience commands more often. Right. It, it doesn't actually. If you do twice a week through the obedience, it doesn't make it go any faster. It's still going to be six to seven, eight weeks with basic with the obedience, mm -hmm. except you just learn more at that time to be able to do more. So when you get to the socialization part and the public access part, you and the dog are a better team than if you just did it once a week. Right. It doesn't mean you can't go through it once a week. It's just a little bit slower uh, and there's a little bit more pressure that you kind of feel like, well, nothing seems to be going fast. It seems to be repetition, 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 which it is. But if you're only going to the class once a week, you're going to be rep repeating everything. If you go to class yeah. twice a week during the obedience, you're doing more so you just don't realize it. Well, and but it's the same. I mean, but it's the same concept as military training, though. Muscle correct. memory. And right, correct. You do re you do the repetition. You repeat the same things over and over, yeah. so that it becomes natural for you and natural for your dog. Correct. And that's, I mean, that's kind of something that kind of befuddles me when you tell me about how many people drop a program. Is well, you know, there's a lot like, and you and I've discussed what it happened is. You know, okay, well, here's a good example. The veteran went through that, you know, had two dogs, mm -hmm. you know, that didn't come through the tats all part, but, you know, got hijacked, which, you know, that's fine. You know, if, if they didn't have to train service dogs, hopefully they're still training service dogs with the, with the knowledge that they gained from tats all. If mm -hmm. they're not training service dogs, then it was a waste of their effort and the time that they spent with tats all to not be able to pay it forward and help more and more veterans. Right, right. So, you know, but – he had the ability to train his second dog. And that's what it's about to give you that ability, that confidence that you can do this yourself because nobody's going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go, you know, one of our questions is, you know, with service dogs, how often do you reevaluate? Do you re uh, assess your teams? Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, that's all doesn't reassess them unless somebody says, Hey, I'm having problems with my dog. She's not doing this or that. It's like, okay, we'll come back in. Let's, let's fix it. Mm -hmm. Because you are the one that's in charge of your dog. When you get one of these cookie cutter, as we call them, pre-trained dogs, they're a perfect dog. And 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 the story and an organization gives a veteran a perfectly trained service dog with a two week training period to how to operate the dog. The unfortunate part is the dog is perfectly trained, the veteran's not. They're not properly prepared. So after six months. There's a phone call of, uh, hey, you need to come in and let's reevaluate your dog and let's see what's wrong after you've already called and said, hey, I'm, some of the dog's not doing this or that. So you go back six months. They retune the dog up. They don't show you how to retune it. You know, you're still kind of in the dark learning how to about your dog. And every six months for two and a half years, you're going back to get reevaluated, to, to be retuned. Right, right. Because you haven't had the experience of training your dog. See, that would stress my ass out right there. <laughs> I'm telling you, if and then you had to I, wait two years to get a dog. If yeah. you had to wait two years to get a dog, you know, you 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 at least you didn't win the suicide lottery for the day. Right. And back when you and I first talked, I can't even remember how many you know, service dog companies I talked to, and you said you know that I could train Scout. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, because I already had a dog, and I didn't have to sit around and wait two and three years. We could just you know couple more months and scout would be qualified right well but you know you also mentioned something bart and and audience uh, when you're listening you gotta you i need you to remember something bart and i talk almost daily we talk about issues in the service dog world we talk about you know uh challenges in in just in the nonprofit world we talk about uh everything under the sun we talk about what i'm turning on the lathe this week you know um so it may seem like we're a little callous when we talk about veteran suicide and, and remember that again, veterans, we joke about this. This is, you know, dark humor. If we don't have dark humor, we don't have much humor in the veteran community. Um, so, you know, Bart mentioned, you mentioned the, 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 the suicide lottery. Um, and, and I want you to talk to, to the audience about the bubble because I love your, your description of how, getting a dog into a veteran's hands to begin training and begin working with gets them off the bubble. 
Oh, it gets off. I want to go back to one thing. We start, uh -huh. and, I, and I didn't finish. I just told you of the incident about the veteran that went through with his two dogs, one, and you know, like that. Yeah. We find I see that out of the completed applications, we only have a twenty percent success rate as far as who completes their program. Uh huh. Which isn't. I mean, that's it's one out of five. That's not bad. But two out of five of the veterans are going to feel that they can go ahead and train the dog all by themselves. Mm hmm. And if they can train the dog by themselves and follow the ADA, you know, guidelines, well, then that's what the guidelines are for, for them to be able to follow it and do what they need to do to have a service dog. Mm -hmm. So if I'm only accrediting one out of five and there's two out of the five, two others are doing it themselves because they just don't have the time or they just don't want to go through it with the trainer because they're doing something else and, and it's just too much trouble and they take and train their own dogs. Well, that's two more veterans that have service dogs. Mm -hmm. that are good service dogs. The other two out of five are either have, have either gone through another program, you know, and this was trying to see who they're going to get out of first, or they just felt that, well, you know what? I really don't need a dog that badly. It's too much work. Mm -hmm. I was just doing it because it's a benefit. Mm -hmm. So there's a good chance that cats all really doesn't have the 1100, you know, the 1,118 service dog teams out there. There's a chance that there may be, another 2,200 out there that got a dog on their own, went through the training by themselves, and they're off the suicide bubble. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's about, taking them off. The suicide bubble that I refer to is that every veteran who has anxiety and depression and, and, and bad thoughts uh, on a regular basis, they're on this bubble. Uh, to make them wait and be taking drugs and not have a backup is, is pretty scary. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why we want to get a dog into the hands of a veteran as quickly as possible. And when I say a dog, I'm talking about a 14 month, a five or six year old dog, not a puppy because a puppy requires a lot of different puppy language to learn how to read mm -hmm. with an older dog with the right attitude and the right, you know, uh, characteristics, personality, the dog can actually pick up on that adrenaline and cortisol when it's released into the system. The mm -hmm. suicide bubble doesn't come out the 15 to 20 minute mark into it after You've been in a panic attack. That suicide bubble occurs probably within three to five minutes after the trigger mm -hmm. because people don't realize that they're putting a gun to their head or grabbing a knife and trying to cut their wrist. Mm -hmm. When they do that at that three to five minute mark, once they've been triggered and the thoughts in there, pretty much the dog is stepping in to in between like, hey, what's going on here? And wakes the person up and gets them off that bubble. Right. Once right. they realize that they were there and they had a battle buddy save them, they're pretty much, it's okay now. You've mm -hmm. got it made. You're out of the bubble system. Now it's just going to be a road to recovery and healing. Yeah. But the suicide that occurs after somebody's 15 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes into a panic attack, uh, they're either being pushed because somebody's standing there and goading them or, 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 or they're just being backed into a corner quicker and quicker. But that actual suicide comes three to five minutes. Now, when some a veteran goes out into the parking lot of the VA and decides to commit suicide in front of others, it's because he's lost all hope because the VA has taken it away from him. Yeah. And it's just a reactionary thing. I'll, I'll show them. I'll just kill myself here. Mm -hmm. But the suicide had already been initiated that I'm, I'm having a bad day. Let me try to make it in here because I know something's wrong. And to be turned away by the VA is, I mean, it's just a, a criminal offense. And, and you and I have talked about that, you know, that yeah. when you go there for help, that's what you're there for. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The and there are, bubble, you know, if you're on the bubble and you're, and you have those thoughts, uh, you can't afford to wait 18 months to two years after you've been accepted into a program. Right. Uh, right. You know, and so, but it's about getting the dog into the hands of the person, just letting them feel and touch and smell that dog. And, uh, and going from there. Well, and, and letting the dog touch and smell and feel the person and, and start to connect. And that, I, I think, um, and you know, you and I, like I said, like I said to the audience, you know, we've known each other for uh, a few years now. We met and, and, and had a lunch and a long conversation uh, while I was doing interviews for the book. And you are part of, part of the book. Um, and 
Am I, I part I, of the kids' book? Am I part of the kids' book? No, you're not in the kids' book. <laughs> yeah, you're the color. Congratulations on getting your new book published. Thank so. you. Thank you. And we'll I talk think, about that. We'll I, talk about I, that. I just wanted to go ahead and bring that up. Just yeah. But, um, but, you know, we talked about – now, I had been forming this, 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 this whole concept in my head, and I hadn't put a label on, on it yet. But when you and I had the conversation, kind of things clicked, and I got a label, and it's, I call it cooperative training. So, so the, the, the way it works is you, you know, I go to Tadsaw and I say, Bart, I need help. Uh, and and you, there's a trainer in my area. And so right away, if I have a dog, the trainer will evaluate my dog and see if that dog is suitable because the bond is already there. Is that so, so, so the trainer will help evaluate the dog to see if it's suitable to do service dog training. If I don't have the dog, the trainer works with me and local rescues to find a suitable dog. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, but we do it a little bit more like the drill sergeant that you had and your, and your first sergeant or your master chief in, when you were in the military. Okay. Uh, they didn't ask you who you wanted to be your battle buddy. They, they kind of said, they yeah. kind of said, this is your new battle buddy. Learn, right, right, yeah. learn how to learn what his likes are, his dislikes <laughs> are, and he's going to have to learn your likes and dislikes but you two should make it out of the, you know, yeah. when you get there. So, so yes, they, you have a choice. And, you know, we, we tried to let everybody know is we'll try to find the right, we, when we find the right dog, it's the right personality, the right temperament, the right lack of aggression issues, the right dog is going to make a service dog. He right. may not be exactly the right breed. Right. If, right. if the right breed is there, we're going to, we're going to come through for you. But if it's not the right breed, you know, don't, don't turn down a dog because he's, you know, he's not the right breed that you were looking for. He's not Rin Tin Tin. It's not going to be Lassie. Trust me. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and that's, you know, what, Duke. Again, and you know, you're, you're looking for a dog to fulfill the need. Correct. Rather than the desire for a breed. Correct. Need before breed. Absolutely. You know, and then you have people who may have more uh, different cases, you know, disability. I mean, me, for example, I need a dog that's large. Because I have right. some mobility, you know, I need some some assistance with mobility. So, right. a poodle's never going to work for, well. A standard is still too small. A poodle's never going to work for me. You might I'll need a flea. Fact I just don't like their their personalities. But you know, you know, we're, so you know, when when the, when a veteran talks to you and you give the inform pass the information down, they fill out their application form and everything. You're gonna your your trainers uh, going to look and try to find the appropriate. Correct need filling dog correct we, we we choose a dog based on the task right right so if you have a task where you need a you know a because you're six foot four and weigh 260 or 270 uh then yes you need a dog that's going to weigh at least 100 pounds right because right. Of the size of the bone and the structure you're yeah. also going to get a dog that's not a two-year-old he's going to probably be closer to three or four because you need that maturity so we we try to size the dog to the person Mm -hmm. needs not just say well this is your dog if you like it too bad yeah uh, and that's know. not to say that small dogs can't be service dogs oh no god no. On what the needs are of the individual so Correct. if there's mobility then of course you have to find a dog that's a, at least a third the person's weight for the safety and health of the dog so right. i want to make sure people are clear on that it's not well you know only 100 pound dogs can do it look if you weigh a buck 35 soaking wet a 45 or 50 pound dog will do just fine for you. Right. You don't have to have the 100 pound dog. No, and, and, if, and if you have a small dog, like I have probably dogs weighing under 25 pounds, which we go with that as trying to be our minimum dog weight that we'll pull out of a shelter. Mm -hmm. Probably the dogs that weigh under 20 pounds, I would say are probably, I'd probably say at least 20, probably 15 to 20% of the total number of teams. Right, right. Which puts that at, you know, now you're talking like 150, 160 teams to 200 teams. Yeah. And yeah. when you think of that many dogs in a program, you know, that's, that's a lot of dogs. Yeah, definitely. That's a whole lot of dogs. And, and you know, and then I'd say probably at least 60% are pit crosses. Mm -hmm. You know, the dogs. Know those holy breeds. Yeah. You know, Shame on you, Scout. <laughs> Mine's over there snoring on the couch right now. <laughs> you know, well, he knows it. Look, it's you know, you 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 know, you, it's like the ball. 
It's like the ball episode with you. <laughs> oh, no, no we're talking, the bully is great. Skeeter, now the ball issue and Skeeter, that's, yeah. Yeah, well, the ball issue. We'll have to so touch on that story when we come back, but we do have to take a quick break. <laughs> you are listening to the Service Dog Show right here on DV Radio, WDVR. Our special guest, Bart Sherwood of Tadsaw. And uh, we will be right back after this. DV Radio. What's DV Radio? DV Radio is for you, the veteran, active duty service member, caregiver, and civilian supporter of the military. DVRadio.net is the online veteran network made for and by veterans. From original shows to syndication, you can find it here on DVRadio.net. In an effort to continue our mission and make better quality shows for each and every one of you, visit our Patreon at Patreon.com forward slash DV Radio. Whether you can only pledge $1 per month or that entire million dollar inheritance, your uncle left you there's a tier with rewards waiting for you so why not keep dv radio running and get rewarded at the same time head to patreon.com forward slash dv radio now that's patreon.com forward slash dv radio are you looking for veteran resources and peer support objective zero has an app for that Download the Objective Zero app for free from the App Store or Google Play. Access wellness resources like yoga and a free year subscription to Headspace, the world's most popular meditation app. Check out veterans resources and access our nationwide network of peer support. Speak to fellow women veterans or someone in your field and branch of service. You get to choose who you want to chat with. Learn more at www.objectivezero.org. That's www.objectivezero.org. On February 5th, the Department of Transportation published a set of proposed rule changes for air travel with service dogs in the Federal Register. This 94-page document is complex, but could have an adverse effect on the lives of every disabled handler of a task-trained service dog, as well as the disabled owners of emotional support animals. The future of equal rights for disabled people as we know it could be jeopardized by some of these proposed rule changes. As stakeholders, it is in the best interest of all disabled people to register their comments on this NPRM before the deadline of April 6, 2020. Please go to the regulations.gov website, search for the notice titled Traveling by Air with Service Animals, and click on the Comment Now link in the upper right corner to make your voice heard. Remember to be polite and professional so that your comment will be registered. Together, we can ensure that the voices of disabled handlers of task-trained service dogs are heard. Shooters Express is Charlotte's number one destination for all personal defense, sport, instruction, and recreational shooting supplies. They offer concealed carry classes for only $29.95. That's only $29.95 for concealed carry classes. And if you're military or law enforcement, you'll receive great deals and be eligible for even more at Shooters Express. So head over to Shooters Express in Belmont, North Carolina, or visit ShootersExpress.com for more information and monthly deals. That's Shooters Express in Belmont, North Carolina. This is not a paid endorsement from Shooters Express, and is provided solely by the Radio Free Charge. Welcome back to the Service Dog Show. I'm your host, Joaquin Watai, also known as PTS Dog. And I'm your host, Scav. So we want to talk uh, a bit about um, the Dog and Pony Show. We want to talk about the Dog and Pony Show. And that's another reason why I personally find Tadsaw to be in my opinion one of the one of the best uh, if not the best um, service dog training organization for veterans out there is you don't use your veterans for advertising so you know talk to me about the dog and pony show what is a dog and pony show a dog and pony show is what everybody and a lot of things refers to as how do we make our our, 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 our things jump how do we make our clients jump and perform? for the sake of getting more and more money. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of organizations that just rely on that. Uh, You either have to sign off that you're going to do any kind of uh, demonstrations, show and tells, things like this in order to get a dog from the group. Mm -hmm. Uh, I kind of feel that's just not, that's not the veterans job to have to do to raise money for an organization. The organization is supposed to take care of the needs of everybody. If they can't get their money through grant writing or whatever, then maybe they need to go find something else to sell because they're not going to sell the souls of their veterans to make money on it. And, and I just am against dog and pony shows. I've 
often told any donor that, you know, if you're looking for a dog and pony show, because they always want to meet a veteran and be able to talk to them. And I'm just not going to allow anybody to ask a veteran, so why do you need a service dog? What did you see when you were at war? You know, I think mm-hmm. it's inappropriate. I'm trying to get these these veterans back to their families so they can do things with their kids, not have to relieve, you know, uh, the their episodes and their, their what they saw with strangers. If they want to tell the stranger, that's fine, but that's not the, what they're up there for. It, it, it happens more often than people realize, and the VAs are probably the biggest culprit out there. Um, no, they are. Uh, I got hooked up with a, a, an instructor for a, a pistol um, pistol class out on a shooting range, and then I found out the only reason he needed me out there because it was a civilian instructor. His entire staff except me was um, civilian. And he brought me on because I was a combat vet, and that's how he was selling this class. Mm-hmm. I, I was like, "The hell with this!" Yeah. And yeah. as soon as I left, you know, it, pretty much the class was down to three people. Well, okay. yeah, I mean, it's just that that's not the job of the, the job of an organization that takes care of veterans is to take care of the veteran, right? To, not, you know, I not mean, if it's the veteran, yeah. And I just find it, I find it just disgusting to do it, and I mean. Uh, you know, I had a grant writer that said, uh, we need to start telling more stories about your teams. And I said, well, I just don't feel comfortable with that. Well, you can use different names. I said, well, then I'll give you a combination, you know, of, of, of all my teams because they're all alike. They all got the same problems. They all got the same deals. You know, I mean, when somebody comes to me, I don't have to ask them, what, what did you see or what did you do? I have no agenda to write books or stories about them because it's not my job. Hey, we're all coming to you for help. We need something. That's, and that's all you hear. The only thing you come here and I tell my trainers is they're here to get a dog trained. If yep. you guys get, if you get too close to some of these veterans, you know, then, then don't come running to me when it's like, well, he was such a good friend. It's like, no, you're, you're a drill sergeant. These are your, these are your, these are your students to train and get out of there. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be friendly with them. You can talk to them, but just remember one thing. You are the drill sergeant. You need to make sure they do their job, yeah. which is to train their dog. Back yeah. when I contacted you, I forget how many people I talked to, and I went with you because you're the most open and honest with me. Mm-hmm. It's not because I can get in. Hell, I still had to wait until Scout was over a year old. Mm-hmm. But you were the most open and honest. We had the, a, a great conversation. You didn't sell me a line of shit. It was just, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, I was going to train side by side with Scout. And that was great. You know, somebody wasn't going to hand me a dog that I'd never met before. Yeah. And the bad part is if you and the dog that that you were sent there to meet at a dog, you know, at one of these cookie cutter places, if you and the dog didn't didn't get along, guess what happens? You don't get another dog. Right. You get sent home. You're taken to the airport. With a, you know, come on, get your bags. We're going to the airport and drop you up. Not even take you into the airport. They just drop you off at the curb and they take off. And then I, that I, bubble gets busted. And, and I know Joaquin's had some of those. I've had, a, I've had a veteran spouse contact me. And the veteran was locked out of the building and left to wait for six hours outside on the porch. Because he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, b- match up with any of the dogs. And they, they literally kicked him out and, and locked him out of the building and left him on the porch. And it's just, I mean. I mean, you know, I've told Joaquin about, you know, a friend of mine who went down and trained for two weeks with a dog. And the night before graduation, they came to him and said, uh, we're taking your dog away because your dog's got dog aggression issues. Wow. And, wow. <laughs> and dropped him and sent him home. He got to the top of the bridge and he thought, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to stop. I can't take this crap anymore. I'm going to commit suicide. And you know, that type of crap that goes on all the time, it's these, these people need to be held responsible. When we match a dog and a veteran up and the veteran decides, you know, this isn't exactly what I want. The only thing we tell them is that, Hey, if you're going to quit the program, just take care of your dog. If you don't want your dog, bring him back. We'll take him back right away. But if you do not want your dog because it's just too much stress, we will be more than glad to rehome him. But we will not force him and say, well, if you don't come to training, we're going to take your dog away. 
because this is the only lifeline this guy may have or this, this, this woman may have. And I am not going to set somebody up to fail. Right. It, it doesn't. And, you know, it, it, and, and, and let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, touching on kind of the, along the same lines and along the lines of the dog and pony show is demographics. And this is a touchy subject. Um, but not I think, for me. Not well, for I, me. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you know, people, I mean, people get up in arms about, about it. I mean, race is, you're bringing race into it. Oh my God, you know, what's, this isn't supposed to be political. Okay, but think about something. And, and I've seen some improvement over the last year. But when you look at the advertisement of most of the big name service dog training programs. You mean the dog and pony shows? The dog and pony show programs. They don't show all the dogs, do they? Or the ponies? No, I mean, the, the, they show primarily white males, usually with an amputation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, usually running labs or shepherds, right? Yeah. It's, and yeah, the dogs are usually labs or shepherds. They're big four dogs, but, and there's a couple of things we can say about this. And I think to me, in my mind, one of the most egregious people come to my page all the time. Civilians come to my page all the time. And say, is there any, are there any organizations out there to help me? And the answer is not unless you've got twenty five, thirty five thousand dollars to pay them. There are a lot of organizations out there helping veterans, helping disabled veterans. And that's great. There should be. There are almost none out there helping civilians. Why? Because you can raise more money showing pictures of veterans missing a limb with a dog next to them. And am I am I being too cynical in that part? No, nope. oh, God, no. Oh, definitely not. Definitely not. Uh, and you don't, and you, and, and, and the, the females or, or, or even just not females, but males, uh, who are military sexual trauma survivors, they're not even pictured. Yeah. Yeah. They're not even pictured because of the fact, you know, it's just the, the way military sexual trauma is, you know, it's in the military. Not an, it's not an image that, many people are willing to approach they don't want to approach it they don't want to hear about it they want to they want to be that 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 ostrich with its head in the sand uh, you know yeah and that's i think um we brought up a good point it's not just females however and this is i hate saying this what i'm about to say but it's accurate i can almost guarantee that when a female comes to, to the PTS dog page and says, I need help getting a service dog. The next thing she's going to tell me is I'm an MST survivor. Yeah. It's not nine times out of 10. It's not 15 times out of 16. It's 59 times out of 60. Mm -hmm. That's wrong, but it's a reality. That's a reality. Yeah. I mean, and, it's... and, and it kills me. It, it, you know, I got to tell you, I was an NC, I was an NCO. I was an E6. I had 65 people under me uh, about 18 to 20 of them were women. And they, I can't even imagine it having occurred with one of the troops under my, under my uh, responsibility. And honestly, I can't imagine how I wouldn't have ended up in the stockade because I would have killed a motherfucker. You know, I just, it's something that is so abhorrent to me, but at the same time, but, but, it, but, but you also knew that your mother would go ahead and knock you in the head if anything like that happened with yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, it's just, so. it's abhorrent to me, but at the same time, it's common in the military and it's just, and, but you know what, again, going back to the dog and pony show and the demographics, you're not going to see a lot of pictures on some of these pages of. Uh, African American females who are MST survivors, mm -hmm. because it doesn't raise enough money. No, That's, and you're not going to find it. You're not going to find a male on there as an MST survivor, right? Yeah, you don't. Yeah, I mean, the because when they've got to give their story to be able to get into the program, they're just going to, uh, you know, just, uh, nobody wants to hear that. Yeah, yeah it's not worth. Yeah, that's not worth my time. I don't need to relive that. I don't need to rehash that. Uh, you know, and it's not, and it's, and it, and it, and it's. And and 
military sexual trauma besides harassment, you know, uh, rape, let's just call it what it is, rape. Yeah, rape, yeah. Vi a violent sexual act, okay, mm -hmm. is, is not really a, it's not, it's not a sexual act. It's a, it's an act of power. Yes. Of being more powerful than the person, the other person, whether you're holding a 45 revolver in your hand with the gun pushed up against the person's temple or underneath their jaw, you know, or whatever. It's, it's not a sexual fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's a horror story of a criminal act. And, and so it's a, it's a thing about power and, and that's what it, it is. It's an abuse of power. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and what this, you know, though, as disgusted and horrified as, as I am about the prevalence of it, what makes it worse is the prevalence of sweeping it under the rug of commands, not pursuing it. And, and oh, well, they don't even have a rug anymore. They took the rug out of the room. Yeah, they just I mean, leave it just, there with the dust bunnies. Nobody yeah. cares. <laughs> and, no, oh, nobody you, cares. It's a dust bunny. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Corporately, nobody cares. Nobody and yet, cares. there are people like you and 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 Scav and I, and we, we we try to reach out. We try to support veterans, and these people approach us. And one of the biggest complaints, especially in the female veteran population, is is military sexual trauma. Yeah. And you know what? People may not care, and they may be you know ignoring it and trying to hide it, and in, in, you know, on active duty and in, in service. But out here where we're doing everything we can to try to save each other's lives. This is a big, big problem and trying to hide it that these, these groups that try to hide it and don't acknowledge it when they're training service dogs is just as egregious as the chain of command hiding it mm -hmm. when it happened in the military. Mm -hmm. It's just as bad. It's it, it, you know, folks, this is not a fun subject. Oh, I'm it's a bad right. I'm it's pissed. A, it's, it's, it's I am pissed off right now. You know, it's it's a subject that we shouldn't be talking about. But yeah, going but back it, to dem but going back to demographics, uh -huh. you know, we yeah. have three hundred we have three hundred feet five female veterans that are have service dogs in our program. Mm -hmm. You know, out of the eleven hundred eighteen, almost. A and, and I've got and I've got you know a little bit over almost thirty percent, like twenty seven. Yeah, more than a quarter. Yeah, more than a quarter yeah. of your team. But 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 I've got two hundred and fifty four total MSTs mm -hmm. in the program. So a a quarter of about eighty percent. About eighty percent. You know, sixty percent is what the army talks about. You know, mm -hmm. the military talked about as far as being victims of military sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. Probably it may have been closer to eighty percent. Four out of five. Yeah. Okay. Somewhere along the line of all different types of harassment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I just look at my figures, as far as the 248 females out of the 305, I'm at 80%. Yeah. So I think probably my, my demographics of how many women military sexual trauma survivors or harassments, you know, have been uh, in there is about probably closer to what the truth is. Uh, you know, because we're always talking about numbers of, of either the suicides and, and, and you yeah. know, what what really are the numbers? How much are they closer to? And, uh, you know, it's, little by little, I'm putting that puzzle together. It's And it's, you know what? It is it is one of the most disturbing statistics in existence. The reality of how prevalent it is, is it's it's bone chilling. It is and, or six. And, yeah. And, and, and the military is no exception. No. And, 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 and in a lot of ways, you know, um, we're talking about demographics and we're talking about, uh, we're talking about, uh, diversity and everything. diversity. Yeah. Diversity in the, in the service. The, the military is a microcosm of the, of the U S population as a whole in diversity so you have a certain percentage of the military they're just they're just white and you have a certain percentage that are african-american certain uh, percentage that are hispanic uh, asian american uh, you, you know and you draw all these lines but but you know and scav you, you you'll attest to this too there's only one color when you're in the service and that's green it's green yeah you're all really? equally worthless. i thought there were two colors i thought well, there were blue, two colors blue and green yeah okay i was going to say you blue because that's the yeah. Maybe man's not going to wear green. Maybe, you know, maybe Air Force <laughs> and Coast Guard are blue, Army and, and uh, uh, Marine Corps are green. But there's yeah. one color. You're all the same. You're, as, uh, to, to quote Gunny Hartman, or not Gunny Hartman, uh, Gunny uh, Full Metal Jacket, 
Oh, Gunny, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, anyway, Brother Gunny from Full Metal Jacket. Yeah. Yeah. You are all equally worthless. And yeah. that we, we were. There was no there was no skin color. It didn't matter. We were all worthless. We were all, you know, uh recruits and we all had to train and meet the same standards and 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 that kept, that went on. It didn't really color, you know, it really didn't matter what color your skin was and and honestly Probably some of the most open and and comrade, uh, comrade like or, or or you know some of the best camaraderie was over horrible racist jokes and, and you know we would crack on everybody over everything and if it, you know if we were telling if we were telling racist jokes everybody got it the same you know we were telling white people jokes brown people jokes black people you know, jokes. Jewish jokes I mean you yeah. know oh yeah make- everybody got cracked on it yeah. was. You know, it was, it was even. It was equal. We were we were making fun of each other completely equally, um, but at the same time, that was out of mutual respect, and having learned that it didn't matter what color your skin was, what mattered was who was you know. What mattered was that the person in the foxhole next to you had, had your back. Your, had your back. That was your battle buddy. It didn't. It, color didn't matter. But we get out here in the civilian world, and all of a sudden, these are things that people count. These are things that people worry about. These are things mm-hmm. that <clears throat> government grants depend on. And I'm, and I'm bringing that back around and, and, uh, to, because we wanted to discuss the, the Pause for Veterans Therapy Act a little bit. Um, and I think I, th- I, I agree with you, Bart, in your opinion, that the demographics of the veterans served – under this act, if it gets passed through the Senate, are very important. And must be. Must be. It yeah, has it, to be. Yeah. It, 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 and there are laws regarding federal funding that count on meeting certain demographic standards. Well, at least, at least on this one, it's going to be because, you know, like we talked about, this one, we will go to Congress for it. We will go yeah. to the Senate to bring it up because I see way too much money being spent by the uh, Uniform Health Sciences of, you know, the military uniform services, you know, throwing money away for non-demographic, you know, uh, dogs. And also the same as the insurance that's being peddled by the VA for dogs that are given to veterans of certain organizations. Those dogs are not falling under, you know, the uh, specific needs of the demographics of those veterans that are being served by those organizations. Right, right. You know, it's... And as I tell my veterans that are filling out our survey is if a veteran has a service dog, he's supposed to get a, should get something for the benefit of his dog, not from the organization or paying the organization Mm -hmm. to go ahead and have not to pay something that they've already got, you know, included on the dog because most of these organizations, they own the dog and the right to take it back for three years after the dog's been placed. Oh, that one gets me. Because of the fact, if you're not taking care of your dog, they sure as hell don't want a dog that's 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 sick and not being taken care of. They need to make sure their investments covered, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah, and that's 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 the real you know sorry part is that you, you can lose your dog at any time, and and who's going to be responsible when you pick up that dog? Because if he decides that all hope is gone and he commits suicide, uh, somebody's accountable. Right. Which yeah. is another thing that we always talk about: accountability and responsibility. You the know. art concept was I, I fully admit that you and I developed that that idea together. Um, mm-hmm. I give you full credit for for helping me process that whole idea of accountability, responsibility, and training. Yep. Um, I mean, you know, that was that was absolutely collaborative effort to to come up with that that concept. It, it's just, you know, the thing that the thing that I think that it brings to mind, and I've tried to. I try to express this on the, on the PTS dog page and some of the pieces I've written and you and I talk about it all the time is as a veteran, when you go out and you're looking, you need help. You're at the end of the rope. This is when, when veterans say, maybe I need a service dog when everything Mm -hmm. else, nothing else worked. Mm -hmm. I I, I don't know about you, Scav, but for me, the pills weren't working. Laying laying in bed, staring at the ceiling and, and just getting up in the morning so that I could take my drugs and taking my drugs so I could go back to bed at night. That was my life. 
And I'm I was literally laying there in bed staring. That was my life for that was my life for 24 years as a owner of a pharmacy. <laughs> don't pharmacy. don't go knocking him, man. That's what <laughs> kids through college for me. Yeah, well, you're, what you're what talking about is, this is my know, red and butter here. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, what I'm saying though, <laughs> I mean, literally, I, I was laying in bed staring at the ceiling, waiting, and you know, another hour and a half, two hours, so I could take my meds, so I could go back to sleep. And I th remember thinking to myself, "There's just this is not living." I'm not alive. And it's at that, that point, it's, it's it, in my experience, when veterans say, I need a service dog, they're at that point where something's got to give. And there's two ways it can give. You can either find a solution that doesn't involve taking all the zombie cocktail, or you can give in to the zombie cocktail. Half of those drugs have counterindications for suicidal ideation. No, no, they have a black box warning. It says Mapo yeah. that suicide. Yeah, and, and you're giving it to, to, to veterans who's suffering depression, anxiety, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, military-induced anxiety, and, and uh, depression syndrome, whatever you want to call it, you're mm -hmm. giving them drugs that increase their symptomology. And you wonder why veterans – and that's the, the go-to, the VA's go-to. You wonder why veteran suicide is so high? Look at the drugs they're pumping into the veterans to try to pacify them. Yep. You know? Well, it's, like, it's like I told you, if the VA just stopped dispensing drugs, they probably would probably reduce suicides by probably half, five yeah. to seven, seven deaths, suicides a day, and not even realize what they did. Right, just by stopping, you know, dispensing the, the or the off-label use of certain drugs. Yeah, we've talked about that too. Um, you know, uh, yeah, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. Take away all these antidepressants that cause worse problems. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a place. There are hormonal imbalances, chemical imbalances in the brain, and medication can help. I'm saying the number one go-to from the VA system to deal with veterans who they have, have diagnosed with PTSD is to throw this drug cocktail at them, the zombie cocktail, and zombify them. Drug them can, down to, so that they don't care about anything. Can we, can, we, can we add a new term? Sure. Can we add a new term? Sure. Okay. Let's add in military-induced anxiety, depression syndrome. Yes. My ads, which, which is what we've been spouting for years because of the fact I don't feel that you should be labeling any veteran being mentally ill or a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. They served, they did their time, they had a bad job, they got to see a lot of bad things. It was an occupational hazard. Yes. If we can go ahead and treat this, this big elephant in the room, this big gorilla, which I don't like to use gorilla because of the fact you're killer gorilla on your you know, email. <laughs> email. Uh, so I don't want to you know, make reference. But nah. this big gorilla, this ugly gorilla that haunts itself and, and takes away the sanctity of our, of, our, of our soldiers, our veterans, when they get out, mm -hmm. it, it needs to be readdressed. Yeah. You know, I, that, that this is a, it's a, it's a, if we <coughs> go ahead and treat it like an occupational hazard, mm -hmm. then we're going to be able to take care of it like an occupational hazard by train, changing the occupation. You give right. up your 11 Bravo, your 68 whiskey, or whatever whatever your occupational MOS is, and make you into dog handler and dog trainer, and guess what your dog is telling you? Hey, you're not in the military anymore. Come and take care of me. Right. Focus yeah. on me. This is you why the it. service dog works so much easier and so much better, just because of the fact it's getting you out of your former occupation and giving you something new to yeah. look at. It's a, you know, um, it's, this is the quote at the front page of the, of the book. Uh, um, the puppy saved my life. The dog gave me a mission. It abs I absolutely agree. You're getting in, you know, your vocation was the military, was whatever, you know, whatever your, your MOS was in the military. That's what you did. Well, now you're a service dog handler. That's now your vocation. You train right. in, in handling your service dog. And it's a, it's a day in, day out job. It's every day, it's all the time. Um, it doesn't stop. Training never ends. And if you, change your mindset and focus on that. It, 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 just like you said, if you approach it as it, what they're labeling as PTSD now, if you approach it as an occupational hazard and you give that person a new occupation, they begin to heal because mm -hmm. the new occupation doesn't have anything to do with the terrible things that that prior occupation, um, it, you know, it, it entailed. And the same works for, you know, the same thing works for first responders, for firemen, firefighters, right. uh, 
police officers, uh, EMS. You know, the same thing works for, for first responders. Again, it's it, the occupational hazard of the things that they see. And, and you know, I got to say, and I don't say this very often, but I do say this once in a while. Soldiers, uh, you know, service members, we see the terrible things that we see for brief periods of time. You know, a, a year-long deployment to Afghanistan over, you know, over a five-year over a five-year uh, career. So four or five, six, seven, maybe you know, year-long deployments out of a twenty-year career, right? Police mm -hmm. officers, firefighters, every day. EMSs see it every single day over their twenty-year career or thirty-year career. Well, to a degree, I'll agree with that, but I'll, I'll, on one thing, I'll disagree with the military. Mm -hmm. You're part of the family. You're part of the system. Yeah. Therefore, it is an everyday deal for your five years or your 20 years that you served. Mm -hmm. It's no different because you are part of it. You are part of everybody else that's part of that mission. True. You are yeah. part of Whatever your job was, no matter what, you were part of a mission because you were there so somebody else could go do their job. Yeah. yeah so, 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 so even though you may not be combat deployed, mm -hmm. you're still you part of the suffer because of those you knew who were injured and yeah. what they went through. Yeah. Then, uh, because that was your occupation. The, 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 the people, the men and women up at Dover, Delaware, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't think they've got a bad deployment, you know, I'm sure they would love to get out of that place in Dover. You know, when just I go. Because of, just because of the fact they would be able to strike back at whatever's striking at them. Yeah. When I go so, out on those accident scenes and stuff, uh, Joaquin, mm -hmm. I get to come home at night, which is, you True. know, over in the desert. I'm not, yeah. There's I'm not no saying that. No, 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 no. I don't know better or anything. I'm just saying. It's, it's a little different. Yeah. But you look at the exposure. Thing. But it's but, still, it's still, it's still, it's still part of the, it's still part of the, it's, you but I'm know, still patient. The, the occupation. Off. Yeah. Because it's still occupational. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the occupation, when, when an EMS or a firefighter gets, gets really nervous is when they hear the bell ring. Right. Mm -hmm. And the call, because they have no idea. Is it going to be as bad as the last one? Is it going to be worse? Is it going to be better? You know, until they get to the scene, they are already throwing out adrenaline. It's going to be a bad deal. Right. Yeah. And, and if they right. can have their dog with them in the bus, the dog keeps them pretty well focused because once they get there and they, they, they get in front of the, the, the victim, the accident victim, mm -hmm. and hopefully it's a survivor, just not a, that, that their adrenaline that has gone from anxiety now goes to adrenaline of work. Right. Because they're focused on their job. They're not, they're not able to, 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 to break away. No different than somebody that's involved in a, going into combat. Mm -hmm. Once the first shot is fired, you're you're in the fight. You you yeah. got it. You're you're on your deal. You are on your best. Yeah, yeah. But it's that getting that, and then it's coming home to the bed. Then you're thinking about all this stuff, and it just eats away. It eats away and gets hidden because you're trying to go to bed or you take an energy drink. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't like to call it. It's 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 the symptoms of mental health, mental illness, but it's not the etiology of mental health illnesses. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why they need to look at a difference in training to take care of it and looking how do we how do we take care of it? Uh, here's a good one. You know, the VA is big on equine therapy. Equine therapy horses are the best thing to come along to help a veteran. They get them out of the, the hospital, they get them out of they get them out to a farm where it's fresh air and they got animals and horses are so big and gentle and they they smell good. You know, whenever you're around a horse, you never smell, smell the horse shit, the manure. You only smell the, smell the horse. You go to a pig farm, guess what? There ain't no pigs you can smell. It's all pig shit. Yeah. You know, same thing with cattle. But horses, you just, that aroma of, of fresh horse manure is, is like perfume. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so settling to you. And, and the smell of the horse and brushing a horse, because that horse has the same characteristics as a dog. It smells the adrenaline and the cortisol, and it's there to put its head into your shoulder so you can pet it and brush it. When you're brushing and petting a horse, you're releasing oxytocin in your system and in the horse's system. But also the reason that the VA likes it is because you're not going to bring that 1,500-pound or 1,100-pound horse into your house to live with you, and you're definitely not going to be bringing it into the clinic. Right. 
but they want you to have that therapy because they don't want that dog coming in. Yep. Which leads to another reason why they don't want the dog because of all the money that big pharma pays out for testing of drugs. Uh -huh. Why would they want to go ahead and have a four legged animal in the hospital taking care of the needs of their patients when they're being paid money to study drugs and the effects yeah. of drugs? Yeah. You know, which I don't know if you wanted to get into, but man. Well, it, we're out of time. And oh, aren't you glad? <laughs> we are out of time. And it's, aren't but you, you know glad? What? We, we knew this coming into this. I mean, it, it, look, if you want a good conversation, give Bart Sherwood a call. Right. <laughs> I'll tell you. Absolutely. You your ear off and you'll learn a lot through that time. I, I've never had a bad conversation with you, Bart. Um, and it's always Thank a pleasure. Uh, so people can find you and, and how to get a hold of you if they need some help finding a service dog. And, and this is uh, for veterans, first responders, and their families. Families. And take care of our families. Gold uh, star families. Yes. You know, uh, first responders are, are to me is the EM, the, you know, the emergency room techs yeah. in hospital, yeah. the emergency room staff, the, 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 the person, the social worker that works at a VA hospital as an intake, mm -hmm. you know, that has secondary thoughts and PTSD, uh, you know, they're all eligible to get a service dog. If we can, if we can just make it easier for veterans to get a dog yeah. and to be, be picked up and said, Hey, you know what? I think this is going to work for you because it looks like it's a good deal. And yeah. if it means that we put dogs in with it, everybody in the VA system, then let's do that because it's about saving our veterans lives. Yep. It's nothing else. Yep. And, and we don't need, and if we're going to be putting dogs in the systems, then we need to be responsible for putting the dogs in the systems and be responsible for the training of those dogs. I agree. We don't need to be, Blaine's telling somebody else you got to pay for it. Well, and you know what? And the last people that I, I can barely get adequate health care from the VA. Why would I want the VA involved in my service dog? I, you know, because they're, they're going to tell me I have to train the dog this way and I have to do this. And I have to do that. And they're going to try to manage, micromanage my life. No, that's no. not what I need. You know, and I'm going to back you 100%, Bart, because yeah. <laughs> you guys did me a solid. Yep. Tadsaw.org, folks. Go to tadsaw.org. Uh, the contact, hit the contact link. Uh, scroll down if you need to get a hold of Bart. The best, the best way to get contact you. The only way is to call me. Do not text. Do Don't not text. Do not text this man. <laughs> Don't email it. Well, you can email him, but he'll get to it eventually. But if yeah, you call, call him. Call Bart. Call Bart. Tadsaw.org. 210-643-2901. Call Bart. Bart will help you. And you know what? The, the good thing and the thing I like about it, Bart, is that you'll also say, I can't help you, but I know somebody who can. And right. you're never shy. You never shy away from if you're not able to help, of if there, but you know somebody who is, you'll point them in that direction. And I appreciate that because it's not competition. You're not competing with anybody, other organizations. You're just competing with 22 a day. Yeah, it's to get these 22 taken care of, which yep. really is, that's just, you know, I mean, how many are we going to keep taking off on the 22 a day before it starts really to come down? Because we got all these other states funneling numbers in there that, you know. Well, you and I know that 22 a day is a misestimation, but uh, we are out of time. Bart, thank you so much for joining us. I really thank you, Joaquin. Thank you. Time. And um, we'll have you back again because – we can never talk about everything we, we ever want to talk about with you ever in a single show. It's just impossible. So folks, if you enjoyed the, if you enjoyed the interview with Bart, I promise you'll hear from him again. We'll try to, to get him on every, you know, six, eight months or so. Um, and, uh, and, and, and sometimes it'll be pretty topical about what's going on right now in the service dog world. Cause Sometimes we, uh, we like to dig into that. You have been listening to service dog show on DV radio WDVR. I do have to let you know, and Bart, you brought it up. The children's book, the PTS dog children's book is available. It is called, why is that doggy in the store? It is available on amazon.com. Check it out. Uh, you can either look it up under my name, Joaquin Watai, uh, as the author, or you can look it up by the title of the book. Check out the PTS dog page for links and, and, uh, uh, there will be special uh, deal worked out with DV, DV Radio for signing um, for signed copies from uh, signed by both me, Skeeter, and the illustrator Carla Nimitz, a U.S. Coast Guard veteran, 
so uh, stay tuned for that and uh, look for the information at the PTS Dog page, Service Dog Show page. Uh, I'm sure Scav's going to re- re- repeat it on the Scav and Scout page. It's already up. Yep. Uh, so check it out. Uh, once again, Bart, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Well, you, thank you for having me. It was it. always always interesting discussion. Always. And it's always fun. It's always fun. It's what it's supposed to be about. You betcha. Tune fun in next week. Entertaining and, 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 and letting yep. people understand what's going on. You betcha. The more information we can get out there, the better. The better. Thank you once again for joining us on DV Radio. WDVR. Mm-hmm. TV Radio.